Uh, sir, uh, with your permission, may I begin? Please. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome everyone to today's event, which is uh, titled Global Aviation and Aerospace in a Post Coronavirus World. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most uh, influenced and impacted sectors today, or the one that has been most gravely affected by coronavirus pandemic, is aerospace. Uh, it was described by Airbus as the gravest crisis that the aviation industry has ever experienced. Public health and economic effects and the concomitant lockdowns that we saw have translated into a, an assortment of issues. Um, falling commercial passenger traffic, closed airports, massive layoffs, and the, and the layoffs amount to the ten, tens of thousands as well. So reduced business activity uh, to half of pre-COVID levels um, is, is something terrifying for many. So although some governments have attempted to protect their flag carriers with billions of dollars in stimulus that is promised, aviation companies themselves forecast severe declines over an extended period of time. Some are saying it might be as late as 2023, as late as 2025 perhaps for a recovery to take place. So with this background, how can the global aviation and aerospace sector plan and prepare for the post-coronavirus world? And some of the questions that we're interested in are how do major companies such as Canada's Bombardier, for which Carl Moore, Professor Carl Moore is an expert, perceive coronavirus uh, in terms of their growth in their bottom line, as well as the management. So how would global airlines management in terms of some of the things that they did prior to COVID leave them at the mercy uh, of the uh, contagion? Uh, in addition, how does government react to this in terms of bailouts, intervention, regulation, travel restriction, stimulus measures. These are some of the important issues that arise uh, from state intervention in terms of bailing out this industry. And so then what sort of growth do we anticipate in, in emerging and developed markets? And how big a part of the story would a country like China be or others, including us be? Uh, and then there's some further questions specific to Pakistan's uh, um, aerospace and aviation industry, which I'd like to raise with Professor Carl Moore. So just to give you uh, an overview of the sort of things we're interested in, uh, now I'm excited and it is my honor to request President, Center for Aerospace and Security Studies, Air Chief Marshal Karim Sada to present his introductory remarks. Sir, I defer to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Osman. First of all, let me formally welcome Dr. Carl Moore uh, thank you for responding to our invitation, and we are very pleased to have you here. Ladies and gentlemen, I extend a warm welcome to you also. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon to all those in Pakistan. Good morning and good day to others who may be elsewhere. Uh, we are very uh, fortunate to have Dr. Karl Moore with us. He, as uh, Dr. Osman has uh, indicated, He's a professor, he's a scholar, he's author of many books. He's a business strategist and advisor. And so he is perfectly qualified to speak on the subject of global aviation and aerospace in post coronavirus world. Uh, we have all been affected by coronavirus one way or the other. And yet we have not seen the end of it so far. The, impact that it has had, the adverse impact that it has had on all of us is incalculable. And like I said, it is not ending. I will not go to, it has brought the mightiest of the mighty to their knees. You know, you see what is happening in India, you see what is happening in America, you see in Brazil and elsewhere. People have not been able to deal with it in the manner that they wanted to deal. So I will uh, not go into the statistics because uh, Dr. Moore will, I'm sure, present you many, very many of those. So I will generally uh, give you a, a few general trends. Uh, the worst affected, like Dr. Swan also said, are the industries of travel, tourism, hospitality, and airlines. Uh, most schools are still closed and nobody wants to open them. Although they say they will open in September, but people are very apprehensive because it could lead to the second wave. Uh, the technology companies on the other hand uh, and e-commerce companies uh, have been benefited by this because people have been prevented from going out from their homes, et cetera. So out there, it's a battle of survival for most people. 
the trends that I was talking about is that the vacations have changed to staycations. That is to say that people will keep doing vacations in their own country. They will not travel overseas or across borders. The online meetings are in vogue like we are doing now. Otherwise, it used to be face to face. And these are not likely to change uh, very soon because there are various versions of quarantine or border controls in vogue. And there's a lot of uncertainty. And as you all know, uncertainty leads to uh, bad business. It's not good for business. Insofar as aviation is concerned, airlines without government support have gone bankrupt or some are just teetering on that. Airline industry was estimating a 4.3% growth over the next 20 years. And they were hoping that 40,000 new airliners would be required uh, during this period. But all those assumptions calculations have gone out of the window. 5,000 wide body airliners have been permanently grounded. The 747s and A380s are the prime victims uh, of this cut down in the aviation activity. Uh, Emirates Airlines, which had 115 of 242 A380s that were flying is expected to retire 40% of them. And Boeing is going to cut down their production by 50% and Airbus by 30%, although they had a backlog of 10 years of you know, orders that uh, they had. Ma uh, just a few uh, major statistics. Uh, there's a calculation that if the global aviation was shut down, it would reduce the carbon emissions by 950 million tons the world GDP will shrink by 3.6% or $2.7 trillion, and there will be 57% less tourism. Simply stated, the world has changed forever and the future of aviation is uncertain. So I stop here and cede the floor to Dr. Osman Chauhan to formally introduce uh, Dr. Karl Moore, and we will hope to listen to him. Thank you, sir. Um, for our audience watching today, I uh, am extremely gratified that Professor Moore took the time because he is perhaps one of the most qualified people in North America to speak on North American aviation. Oftentimes when a company such as Bombardier has either run into trouble or done very well, I see Professor Moore on television commenting on aerospace and aviation, but this is just one of his specialties. Uh, his most recent work has included things of particular interest to me, including introversion and extroversion as leadership, multidimensional leadership. Professor Moore has shared this knowledge at fora that are extremely prestigious, not just our alma mater, McGill, but at Harvard and Oxford, Stanford, INSEAD, the entire list. That's because he is particularly involved with executive education, not just taking inputs from CEOs as part of his CEO series, but also sharing those insights with the future leaders in aviation and other sectors. So it's difficult for me to do justice to um, a professor of uh, your esteem. I just want to put it on the record that I did study on with you and I did get an A, I'll let the world <laughs> bear witness to that. And with that, I turn it over to you, uh, Professor. Thank you very much, Dario Zum. Uh, Zum was one of, our, one of my top students I've ever had. Really is an incredibly intelligent man. How many languages do you speak now? Well, uh, it's the, the number is shrinking, Professor. Uh, let's just say it is between seven to 10. <laughs> so incredibly clever. Uh, and I uh, know his brother who's here in Montreal. And so uh, a very accomplished family, diplomats, uh, academics now. So you're indeed blessed to have him working with you. So appreciate his kind comments, but uh, he is indeed one of the smartest people I know. So uh, partly why I'm here today, out of respect for his accomplishments and who he is. So I'll just bring up my slides if I might. Um, and let me know if you, uh, if they're working, are we all right here? Yes, I can see them. Good. So uh, let me sure, I'll try to uh, keep it down to 20 minutes. Let me just put on my clock here so that, um, I'm aware of what time it is and I'll get carried away. So go ahead and interrupt any comments you might have along the way, uh, doctor, that'd be particularly helpful or, or Air Marshal, obviously. So I'm gonna go through a little bit about this and uh, I'm a prof at McGill also was at Oxford for many years and still on the faculty there. And so uh, two of the great universities in the world. Um, ah, okay. 
So what I look at is the airline industry outlook a bit at the aviation industry, and then we'll have a discussion about the implications for CAS. So that's what I'll do, but I'll leave the discussion to yourselves. Uh, I'd be happy to join in, but you guys are infinitely more knowledgeable about Pakistan and CAS than I am. And uh, what I was mentioning to the Aramosha, I'd like to come over. I've never been to Pakistan. Uh, I'm co-teaching my CEO insights class where we have 24 CEOs come for an hour and a half each with uh, someone who was born in Pakistan. So uh, just last night, he was talking about his time growing up in Pakistan and uh, living now in Canada. So it's very fresh on my mind. So let me get my mouse to work here. So my background in aviation, uh, this is the advantage of being a bit older, is that it's it, uh, quite years in length. And so I've done exec ed at Air Canada, Lufthansa, BA, IATA, which is the International Airline Transport Association, which is headquartered in Geneva and Montreal. Uh, Bombardier, uh, which uh, is the one of the biggest business jet manufacturers. It um, has really shrunk down from about 60, 70,000 employees to about 20. Its sole focus now is on business jets. I worked with CAE, which is an aircraft simulator. Uh, they train pilots. They're headquartered here in Montreal. I have a CEO come every year to class. ICAO, which is the part of the UN, International uh, Civil Aviation Organization, which is actually headquartered here in Montreal. So Montreal is an unusually rich place to live when you're interested and involved in this industry. In my CEO Insights class or my radio show, I've had uh, CEOs, the last two CEOs over Canada, uh, the CEO of Air France, I'm having the CEO of, and I've had the CEO of Air France, KLM, then I'm having the CEO of Air France uh, on in a couple of weeks. Uh, WestJet, which is uh, the other big Canadian uh, air carrier, uh, current and the past uh, CEOs of IATA, CEOs of Bombardier, the last three, CEO of CAE and so on. So the advantage of having a class and a radio show is that I get to have an hour one-on-one -on -one with these people and really have an in-depth conversation. Then before and after class, I can get into a conversation as well. So for this presentation, I did interviews with the chief economist IATA, uh, SVP of operations at IATA, senior people at IKO, uh, the WHO, because it's a healthcare issue as well, uh, BCG, Bombardier, CA, Air Canada, Air France, and WestJet. So that's kind of the background for the research I've done. Okay, I'm trying to conquer my mouse here, so I apologize. It's astonishing that I can't, I've done this so many times, I still can't learn to do it. So looking at, this is uh, from McKinsey just last month, and in the wave of pandemic, travel tourism migration may take years to return to previous levels. So as the Air Marshal said, this is a matter of uh, years until it comes back. The initial thought is maybe 2021. Now we're looking at 2024, 2025. And we also have a major trend, which McKinsey points out, that is of cross-border digital flows, which are starting to take some of that away that was done before and really has changed the nature of business travel and may change it forever, considerably. Okay, so what we look at it, IATA estimates the global uh, passenger traffic will not return to pre-COVID-19 levels until 2024. This was a change of a year within a matter of a couple months. So the circumstance has, um, has darkened considerably. The delayed recovery is due to a number of factors, including renewed outbreaks. We have second waves, as mentioned earlier, occurring in the US, which is our beloved brother country. Uh, as a Canadian, I pass for an American, because my accent's the same. I watch American television, news. Um, only a Canadian can speak about NFL, NBA, and presidential politics and convince Americans they're one of them. Europeans don't and should not care about football, you know, this kind of football, and they mock it as they should. And it's just something where I did uh, six years education in my university in the US, went to USC and Harvard and another small college. It's just astonishing what's happening in the US. It is almost beyond grasp. And you think that President Trump may be reelected. And Certainly he's done some good things and, and we think about free trade and globalization. He's had some cords there, but in terms of COVID-19, the US as the most civilized country in some dimensions, certainly the best collection of universities, the best number of 
scientists in the world are just astonishing what they've done. And it's part of the American mentality, which is hard to grasp how anti-mask some people can be. And it's about freedom in their minds. It's not about caring for your neighbor. It's not about looking after yourself. And in any faith system, loving your neighbor is just a central idea. You care for someone beyond yourself. And, and America is a very good country in many ways, but there's just this thing about freedom, which is baked into the American psyche, which is hard for the rest of the grasp. So that's something where the US is gonna happen. And so they talk about 40%. And again, stop and start have the same effects as lockdowns, the same emotional effect. Corporate travel budgets are expected to be constrained. Now, one is that we're in a recession, which means one of the first things you cut is your expenses, and an expense you can cut is corporate travel. So that is going to happen because we're in a recession. As well, uh, people are concerned about health care, and when they travel, not only for themselves as executives, but their elderly parents. So there's real concern about other people baked in that. And video conferencing has really taken off. We've discovered the joys of Zoom. And one of the pleasures of this is that I have the pleasure of being in Pakistan remotely without having to travel without jet lag, but I don't have the pleasure of visiting one of the great countries of the world, which is something I've never been. I've been to India six times. I've been to Asia about 30 times, but I've never been to Pakistan. So I'm quite uh, angling for an invitation, which I've already received to come over when time allows and safety allows. But Zoom, um, Zoom is about 40% more exhausting than being in person. And people are being Zoomed to death, metaphorically. Uh, executives, a um, bunch of CEOs, I, I got news last week that we could we can have the class in person. I email a bunch of CEOs that live in Montreal all got back to me within minutes with great enthusiasm to actually be in a room with other human beings. And partly is that, and we were reflecting in our class last night, some people came by Zoom because they're in other countries, but the joy of seeing other people, the amount of body language that you get in person versus Zoom is incredible. So there's real value to being there in person. At least twice in my career, I, I flew across the Atlantic for one hour meeting is I wanted to look someone in the eye, give them bad news and see how they took it. Well, that kind of business travel is changing substantially because of the need of the economy and because why fly six hours for an hour meeting if I can zoom in? And that is something that really, is, I've interviewed a, about a, a dozen 16 CEOs over the last four months during the COVID-19 crisis from a radio show. And one of the questions I ask every CEO is about the future of work. Um, because if in January uh, you had told these CEOs that your people aren't gonna come to work, that how we work's gonna change, they would have said no. But what we're seeing now very clearly, it is changing. Very clearly, if you're a firefighter, if you're a military person, we need you there. A firefighter, if we have a fire, we need to, someone to show up. You can't zoom in. But it's amazing with the long commutes in much of the world, Montreal's not so bad, but Toronto, an hour and a quarter commute each way is considered a good commute. And in LA and London, it's even longer, New York. So this idea that, and the Silicon Valley. So it's something where we've discovered the joys of Zoom, which means business travel is gonna be impacted, probably you know, forever is a long word, but for many, many years to come is we've discovered alternatives. Okay, so, ah, sorry. The chief economist, uh, Dr. Brian at IAD in Geneva, all the previous pandemics have seen this V-shaped recovery. And in six months, we've seen air travel return. So I've asked, uh, like Tony Tyler was the CEO of Cathay Pacific and the CEO of IATA. He's uh, well into his seventies. And I've asked some older men like that, and they've never seen anything like this. This is beyond any other event in aviation history. We talked about 9-11, we talked about SARS. This puts, pales those in comparison. So this is really not gonna be a V. We'll talk about the recovery and show you some charts in a few minutes. Uh, long haul seems to be the last segment to recover. Domestic is starting to come back and I'll show you some facts in a few minutes. 
But the long haul and the planes you make for that, that is substantially changed. He doesn't think it'd be the death of corporate leisure travel, and that's fair enough. It's not the death, it's the decline, but not death. So that's a different thing altogether. Um, gee, I, I will get the hang of this eventually, just in time for the uh, time to be over. So we see that in China, Russia, and the US, domestic travel is up. So it was down 28.4%, uh, but that's actually not bad compared to 95%, which is uh, what Air Canada has seen for international flights. And Russia's back. So the big economies, the big countries, and uh, Russia and China are huge countries, as is Canada, where you can't drive from one city to another. It's going to take you two weeks to drive from one end of Russia to the other, if not longer. So it's something where you need to have uh, that. So domestic's starting to come back, but it's in the big economies. And in the EU, which we would regard in some ways domestic because you have free ability to travel from one to another. So 20 will not be, 2019 will not be the way we look at 2024. Um, lower GDP will impact it, new outbreaks, government mandate lockdowns are looming. So what we see is we're not gonna come back to where we were in 2019 for a long time. We're gonna be substantially less than that even when there's a vaccine, even when things return. Cash is a huge issue. We've seen a number of bankruptcies and um, we're gonna see a number of airlines disappear. Now, part of it is what government response is going to be. Focus on that in a moment. Travel expectations, I flew to um, Toronto, which has been an hour flight from Montreal about a month ago because I commented in the airline industry for the Canadian and other media. So I thought I'd go try it. And I met with, uh, so I flew down on WestJet our number two carrier and back on Air Canada, number one carrier, and met with senior people at both the Montreal and Toronto airports. And Toronto and Montreal are big airports. Toronto is one of the bigger ones in the world with senior people who looked after the healthcare thing and they walked me around and showed me what they'd done to convince me it was safe. So there was a, a, a lot of interest in the media that someone over 55 would have the courage to be on a plane. And they wanted me as an aviation expert to comment on it. So what we see is that the distancing, the temperature checks when you get to the airport that only passengers are allowed in the terminal, the uh, technology Toronto's bringing, and I think it'll spread around the world where you just walk down kind of a, a, a hall and it will, without you knowing, take your temperature and find other factors to see if you're at risk. And then if you are, they will just very nicely ask you to another room. So we see that the airline industry consumer base is changing. Consumer are very concerned about this. You might remember 9-11 and the increase in security, how irritating that was and how irritating it is. This will make air travel more irritating because we want you to feel safe, but it's gonna be irritating and it's gonna cause people to rethink. And what we see is staycations in Canada uh, Canada is the second largest country in the world, beautiful, wonderful nature. Uh, you can travel here safely. Um, so Canadians are discovering the joys of their own country. But I, when I talk to people, there's real hunger, particularly in, as winter begins in a month or so, to go to somewhere warm, down to the States, California, Florida, the Caribbean, and so on. So we're seeing as dramatic changes in the structure of the industry and the cost structure and ownership structures. So ICAO is, uh, IATA rather is talking about uh, a three point plan, which they put forward uh, just earlier this week, implement the ICAO takeoff guidance. So ICAO and IATA are working together with the Mayo Clinic, with the WHO top drawer health organizations, but people are a bit suspicious of IATA and ICAO because they have a dog in the fight is the expression, is that there's a self-interest which they obviously have in here, and so they're not entirely believed because they represent the airlines, they represent the industry, and they're going to be for the industry, and they should be. What have they done is work with um, wanting governments to reopen borders, and this is a big issue, is the government's response and opening up the borders. So we see you have three different scenarios here. You have um, the baseline, the blue, there's potentially a faster vaccine, and President Trump is pushing for that because it would help his reelection. And right now, the US government is focused on Trump getting reelected. 
or Biden getting elected. Like it's something where everything is based on that one thing. And Trump and Biden both honestly believe as they should, they are the best man for the job. And that's fine, they should believe that. Um, I think the world is praying for a Biden victory. I think atheists will be going to church or synagogue or mosque uh, the night before. My atheist friends said they're going to go to church or synagogue or mosque because they can't help themselves. But it, it is what it is. Um, so a, a vaccine and, and the world healthcare system is focusing its energy, its brightest minds and getting a vaccine. So that will hasten that process. But we could have a second wave of COVID and a financial crisis, not just a recession, but something approaching a depression or a great recession that could really dramatically push that out further. So this is the kind of scenarios that IAD is putting forward. Uh, we're hoping for the faster, the baseline is probably the most reasonable, but the red could occur as well. Okay, so when we think about it, there's three elements. One is the airlines, there's the airport operators because their airport in Toronto, they were telling me has over 10,000 employees. And an airport without airlines is really uh, a museum. Just, there's just nothing there. You also have uh, the policymakers that are important, that's the government. Um, IAD is calling on, and ICAO is doing this as well, governments to work together urgently to find ways to reestablish global connectivity by reopening borders, borders and continue with relief measures to sustain airlines during the crisis. IATA call reflects deep industry frustration as government policies such as closed borders, travel restrictions, excuse me, and quarantines continue to annihilate. These are strong words. Things like annihilate. These are big words that they're using here. They don't normally use language like that, but it's deep industry frustration. Annihilate, these are very strong languages because IATA and uh, the airlines, like the CEO of Air Canada, Kalu Nervinesco, he is calling on much more aggressively for the government to do something. Because um, the government, I was teaching Reykjavik, in Reykjavik University in Iceland uh, this weekend. So I go over there and teach a couple times a year, wonderful country to visit. In Iceland, they said, come and you can't get together with more than 10 people for five days but you and your family can drive around Iceland. You can stay at hotels, Airbnbs. You can have dinner with former students. Lawrence is not more than 10 people. Coming back to Canada was a problem. And Iceland lost my tourism dollars because 14 days in our house, we have a small backyard. That's it for 14 days. I couldn't have made my classes. And even if I did COVID-19 tests and came clear, it was 14 days. So Air, uh, Air Canada and Westjet are blaming the Canadian government for some of their troubles, I think rightly so. So what we see is the world, sorry, let me just make this small. The world remains largely close to travel despite the availability of global protocols to enable the safe restart. ICAO has worked with the WHO in order to make this go forward. And I think honestly, they've done a good job and having someone who just traveled recently um, twice on airlines, I think this is something where they've done a good job and they've gone to the right sources, the right people, but will government accept that is the question. And I had a says rightly so, uh, Alex, who I've had on my radio show, Protecting dissidents must be the top priority, but too many governments are fighting a global pandemic in isolation, a view that closing borders is the only solution. And it's something where we've got to get a more uh, nuanced view than that is clearly what the industry is arguing for and they're right. Now, from a viewpoint, another aspect the government can handle is financial relief. So it's something where facing unbelievable losses, unbelievable cuts to these important industries. And we're looking at 40, 50,000 jobs, and there's knock on um, uh, jobs in hotels and restaurants and so on, where there's a huge travel industry that is really impacting this enormously. So there's financial relief. Now we see in the EU, the US, parts of Asia, that there is financial relief occurring. In Canada, we've not seen that happen. So the airlines are calling for that. And I'm working a bit with the Minister of Transportation, who's our local MP, as a matter of fact, about how we should have a, a made in Canada approach, but you need to take approach that's based on the country you're in, not just following what the EU or the US are doing. And again, there's a regulatory relief of allowing um, greater freedom and travel 
there's something called load levels on planes is how many bums on seats. If you don't use the middle seat, you're going to get in the 60s. You need to be in the 70s, well in the 70s, in order to be at least a bit profitable. And what you want is an airline industry has got to be profitable. Otherwise, people won't invest in it. They won't have shareholders. They will not be able to go forward. Okay, almost done here. So what we look at is four different approaches to what the government can do. Um, what they're arguing for is more of a comprehensive approach, support, financial support, as well as regulatory support. We see that there's some stakeholder specific where it's an airline owned by the government. So that's gonna get the support because it's part of the government. There's regulatory and operational, which is what is the freedom to be able to travel. And then a hybrid, which is in between the, the, the two here, comprehensive and regulatory. So this is what the airline industry is looking for. And I, I would largely argue that's the approach going forward we should have. So what we see here is a two by two, which uh, professors love and as men would remember this from class is that we have um, an industry shutdown. So if we have tight border controls, full border closure, maximum travel restrictions, which is what we're seeing largely, it could lead to an, in, it is an industry shutdown and we'll see many, many airlines going away. Now we see that if you have on the other hard here's a government approach, no coordination random, it would have a bankrupted industry. So we need is border controls as well as the government approach, which is at best industry specific and coordinated where the airlines get help for their sector. This is a different sector than other sectors, the banks, for example, where they need more help. And one of the points is that in Canada, as the second largest country with less than 40 million inhabitants, we need the airlines. You can't drive from city to city because it would be days and days of driving. We need it from a viewpoint of our own business people, but we need tourism and travel. And in many countries, including fairly sophisticated countries like the UK, it's a huge industry. And we need foreigners to come and to visit our countries. We've had a huge growth in Chinese uh, tourism, which has really helped. So now when you come to Quebec, they have signs English, French, and Chinese in many of the hotels because we're you know, very much looking in that. And the menu includes Chinese options because we want to appeal to that sector. Okay, airlines won't get into this, but an airport is also something which is an important part of the economy we need to think about. And when you think about the airport, it's the check in the lobby. It's what is the additional security screening you need to have? Uh, what are the passenger waiting areas you got to look at? Uh, what is the board agencies going to do? How are they going to treat you? How quick is it? So the airports is something which are often overlooked, but having uh, been toured around both Trudeau and uh, the, the Montreal and Toronto airports, this is a big part of that's over, overlooked beyond that of the airlines. So we have, uh, get to my conclusion in a, just a minute, we have the Greta Thunberg, Thunberg effect. You remember she's a teenager and there's a Swedish word for this where it's shaming to fly. So what we see among younger people is a negative sense that this is morally wrong to travel very much. That's overstating it, but my, my, among my undergrads, this is a growing thing. Um, I take students last year, went to Tokyo, Bangkok, and Hong Kong. So we go on a trip somewhere in the world, 40 students myself. And I tell a story that when I was 40, I was flying from Kuala Lumpur to Zurich for some reason. And I had been, I wrote on a cocktail napkin I'd, on the plane, I'd been to 41 countries. So I had a new lifetime goal to more countries than I am old which is very cool, but the students go, I'm not sure you should do that. Where there's a sense that my generation, the boomers, we got to travel and see the world. This man has done that as well. It's been wonderful, but now it's saying, this may be wrong is what's happening out there among young people to some degree in the West. Okay. Um, so Boeing and Airbus, one more slide after the Usman. Uh, Boeing and Airbus have been both enormously hit. Airbus laying off 15,000 employees in July. They're ending the A380 production. 747 production's ending as well. They've had zero sales uh, in most months this year since the pandemic at Boeing. Huge issues. The four super carriers in the Middle East are in profound trouble because they're based on flying 
from here through Qatar, then on to somewhere else. So I took students, we found ourselves in Indonesia, we had to get back to Montreal, the quickest way is through Qatar. But we didn't, we spent like two hours in Qatar. Most people in Qatar are not to be in Qatar, they're on their way somewhere else, Dubai, Emirates, em Emirati, even uh, Turkish Airlines. I mean, Istanbul's a big location, beautiful new airport, but they're largely based on a lot of people from the Indian subcontinent, from Pakistan, wanting to get to other places and people wanting to get to India and Pakistan. So that is going to be, they're in profound trouble. The long, thin routes, which means the MAX, when it comes back, actually has some life to it. The C-Series now made by, uh, used to be, was invented, made by Bombardier, now made by Airbus. That is going to be, uh, it's environmentally friendly plane, so it's good, uses a lot less fuel, though fuel prices are down right now. It's the long, thin routes, as opposed to the A380s, the 747s. We all flew to London and then flew from there. We want to fly point to point. So it's going to be an evolution of that more point to point because we can fill those planes. But we need to fill the middle seat. Without that, we have an industry which cannot survive. But Bombardier has a very positive view of business jets. They've shrunk the business down. The founding family I know, and um, Laurent Baudouin had my radio show last year, is 80, just stepped down as chairman, the great founder of Bombardier, he took it over from his uh, father-in-law Armand Bombardier that's named after when it was a small company, built it to this huge company. They focused, they got rid of rail, they got rid of the C-Series, they got rid of regional jets, the Q400, uh, the turboprop, and they focused on business jets. Business jets is having uh, a more positive view because rich people, corporate executives can avoid all that hassle at the airport. So business jets is seen as having a more positive but not a great future at this point. So last slide, the worst time in aviation history. Now it's only hundred years, it doesn't go back to the Roman empire. So, you know, we don't wanna get carried away but it is the worst time in aviation history. There are green shoots showing in the domestic side, China, US, parts of Europe, deep trouble for the mega carries, probably 2024, if things go well, the vaccine and, and also not only vaccine, and there's a large number of people in the US particularly who are anti-vaccine. Um, and I think we see that in other countries as well. It'll be encouraged by the US being, or quite a few Americans being against it. So you need to really have a large part of the population. We've seen that with measles and other things as well, adopting it. Again, there's some concerns in poor countries. Can we afford this? Are the rich countries gonna grab all the vaccine? There's also consumer confidence, one that I'm ready to travel. That may take longer than actually the vaccine. Uh, we're now doing business different. We Zoom, we work from home. Um, it's the worst of times, but perhaps Pakistan and CAS has an opportunity. Because we have a couple years window here where things can be worked on, things can be done preparing for uh, a future in 2024. So at this point, I'll stop the slide share. I'll turn it back to our uh, capable host and I look forward to the discussion and conversation. Uh, thank you, Professor Moore. That was a fantastic presentation for several reasons. One, as you did in our courses, you talked with the experts bringing in their insights field work, something that I haven't done very well in my research, I'm such a theoretician, but talking to the experts adds so much value to the presentation. Uh, another important thing was that you separated the airlines from the airports. Now, uh, the unit of analysis often for us is how are the airlines doing, but looking at the functional unit of the airport is also very important as part of the economic architecture of aviation. Uh, a big fan of the two by two, and I may request that we refer back to it in this Q&A, because I think that's very valuable. And finally, I think that there was uh, an important discussion you raised in your presentation, which was about the difference in the types of routes, the types of planes, and the change in taste, the Greta Thunberg effect, I thought was very interesting as well. So I thank you for that uh, elucidating presentation. And I initiate the Q&A now with my first question, which although I'd wanted to talk about Bombardier, you covered it so well. So I'd like to go to the management issue in airlines, particularly American airlines, but also the global carriers, is that they took things so comfortably for so long. 
that they weren't prepared for this sort of eventuality. And so you had things like spending on share buybacks to inflate stock prices. You had things like ridiculous growth projections, which were stemmed largely on emerging markets, such as Pakistan, uh, as well as the growth in China. And then you had a change in the asset base. So what sort of reckoning have you seen in terms of management as a management guru, the management changes that are required now? And, and what does it say about the way management was done? Well, the question is, is this a black swan? And a black swan in, 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 in parlance is saying is that it's a very rare event. Uh, maybe not in Pakistan, but in England, where I live, there were black swans were very rare. And so it's something which almost no one foresaw that I'm sure some Cassandras did, but by and large, this caught us all by surprise. And so there's a sense of looking forward, boards are saying to CEOs now, is this a, what's, how you prepared for the next black swan? So we had David Bensadoon from Aldo, which is a giant shoe company headquartered here in Montreal, owned by David's family. He's the CEO. And they're discussing those sorts of issues because that is really interesting. What is our preparation for that? But we've seen that there's a, like the CEO of Canada, the CFO taking no salary right now and down from millions. So they were probably in retrospect overpaid they did stock buybacks, which were not in the best interest of the stakeholders. And, and one of the big changes in North America and Europe is we from moving from a shareholder model that above all get the share price up. That's all who matters to where we take a stakeholder where it's the employees, it's the environment, it's the country, a number of other people are important. And that, when it first came out, sounded kind of fluffy and all very nice. But it's starting to become the reality in the North American, Western Europe, where there's not just words, but it's actions. So it seemed that that is the old world of airline management. And the hubris of growth was actually encouraged by IAD and ICAO reports and growth, to your point, particularly in, in the growing economies of Asia. So that there was an optimism that this growth would continue forever. That optimism is, is largely evaporated. And we're going to see is more humbled airline executives with smaller pay packages and uh, less grandiose dreams based on reality. I think that's an excellent coverage of the, the problem that we see looking back. Uh, and now uh, going forward, we've had this ideological thing. I mean, looking at our business schools, for example, and how we train managers for the future, it was almost a right wing thing where business is so important that we sort of looked aside apart from the state. And now um, different, you've covered the Canadian response, for example, very well. So what, what does the Canadian government do? I've seen, for example, that France is really pushing for bailing out, even though Airbus has said, we don't really need this money right now. What we need is change. Uh, and different countries, uh, the government's responding dif differently. What sort of synopsis could you present for the case for state intervention in airlines as something structural in the future? Well, I think we need um, state involvement now and for the next year or two. The question is, how vital is the airline industry and in, in our country, because of the size of the country, because of the population low density, it's absolutely vital from a viewpoint of the business working. It's also vital from one of our central uh, uh, parts of our economy, which is tourism. Now, down the Caribbean, it, tourism is very central to it. But surprisingly, in big countries in Europe and North America, it's a huge part industry, which is vital. So it's something where I would see uh, airline industry as a vital aspect of any major country's economy that the government must support. And what we've seen is uh, rightly a huge um, support for unemployed people in the US and Canada. Uh, and that's helped keep the economy going. How long we can stay in that is a, is a question. We're going into huge deficits. Uh, we have a new finance minister uh, a week or so ago, but that the prime minister disagreed with his finance minister, it appears. So he brought in uh, Priscilla Freeland uh, to be the new, new finance minister, where this is a time of unprecedented state support. And airlines, I think, should be relatively front of the line because of the nature of the industry. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, I'm going to situate it in our local context here in Pakistan because much of our audience belongs to this country and is interested in the suggestions. There's a question uh, by uh, Mr. Ola. And 
mujaddid, and uh, it adds to what I have uh, thought for a long time, which is about the development of aerospace and aviation here in Pakistan. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a background, although we did discuss it and I sent you just for the audience, there is work done right now on a project called Aviation City, NASTEP as it's called, and I've done an independent appraisal of it uh, as well, it functions from the logic of the aerotropolis. You actually build a city around the airport as the hub. That has very different assumptions about the world from what we're experiencing under coronavirus. It actually assumed that air travel would be a core function. And so Aviation City draws upon the industrial and manufacturing strength of the Pakistan Aeronautical Complex. And from that, then we go into other segments of aerospace, but you actually end up building a new city around it. Now, given your experience of, of aviation and aerospace around the world, what sort of viability for that sort of thing would you see? In the short run, it might be tricky, but in the long run, what sort of factors would be important for an aviation city to be developed in a country like Pakistan? I think it's a brilliant idea. It's gutsy. It's clever. It's some risk. But I, that's why I was saying at the end there, there's going to be a couple of years hiatus, but it gives the opportunity to build that city more fully out. And I think it's going to position itself in one of Asia's more important economies, wonderfully suited in this area of enormous growth. I think it's something that is a wonderful long-term approach and plan and strategy that is absolutely has a potential to be brilliant. It may fall short, but I think it's a great idea. And we can see some other parallels at other places that have done things like this around the world. But to do it with the latest thinking, with the latest improvements. So one of the advantages, you can talk to other people and say, what would you do differently if you're doing it again? And they would give you ideas. And they would probably, they, I think most countries that do this sort of thing would be very encouraging of Pakistan and also be very willing to be helpful. So it's gutsy. There's risk, but I think absolutely I would encourage Pakistan to go forward with this. Uh, thank you, Professor. On this point, there's a one place where there may be a discussion and guidance mm. is the transition to commercial. So Pakistan's military aircraft production, MRO, maintenance repair, uh, is in the public sector. And one question has been, how can we bring in uh, corporate energy, corporate vitality, and a transition to commercial activity? So it would be a sort of a public transitioning to private. And what sorts of skill sets and resources or advantages would be required? We understand that the aeronautical complex here in Pakistan at Kamra could be exploited to commercial use. Uh, but how could that be done? Given your experience, what would you comment on that? What's interesting is we've seen that there's been shift of production um, and of parts to China. And part of that is that China is one of the most attractive markets in the world and has been for a long time because of the sheer size of the economy. And China has been going forward. Now, um, the world is somewhat, um, particularly the US, less enthusiastic about China because the concern about having viability. So Aldo had 80% of its shoes made in China four years ago, it's now down to 40%. So an example from last night, where what we see is China's gone up the technology from making simple things. And again, we saw this in Japan in the 60s. The Air Marshal might remember, you know, Japan, and then it went to China, it's cascaded, where to Vietnam, why I was taking students to Vietnam, because it's a high growth economy, and some of the activities from China have been moved to Vietnam, so you're not just dependent on, on China. So I think it's something where, where you say we're in Asia, we're the heart of this great growth market, but we're more trustworthy partner. Partly it's not that I'm, I'm finishing a book. Uh, I did three books on globalization, the Roman Empire, soon finishing Greek, and we all had chapters, uh, my co-author and I in China, so we're just finishing a book on China because China is really important. So China is the middle kingdom because everyone else is to the periphery. Pakistan comes as an important country, but not with the arrogance slash self-confidence of China. So I think that Pakistan is an attractive market. It's also, you look at the uh, scientific training and the capabilities of your people, both from a R&D as well as manufacturer viewpoint, and try to appeal to some of the big manufacturers to do things in Pakistan would be one way that other countries have done successfully 
that you might be able to emulate. I think this suggestion is very important because our relationship with China is described as one of brotherhood. So while you see this antagonism erupting between Washington and Beijing, actually Pakistan is getting a significant investment from China. It's supposed to value $60 billion plus over 10 or X year horizon. And that China has developed, and this is more for the audience that I'm commenting on this, is that apart from their Belt and Road Initiative, which is land and maritime, there's also work on a cyber Silk Road. There's also work on a space Silk Road, so a constellation of satellites. And then finally, there's the aviation Silk Road. One of the things that I've advocated for is leveraging both the capital that comes with this as well as the expertise that comes with an aviation Silk Road to extend not just the airports that you have in China extending towards the West, but also as part of CPEC because the China-Pakistan economic corridor, CPEC is sort of the linchpin of the Belt and Road Initiative taken at large. If CPEC works well, then the Belt and Road Initiative has a strong example of things working. Given your work on China, how do you feel about that Belt and Road uh, logic? What's interesting, you've uh, written um, quite a bit on it. And so I've read your material with considerable interest and, and it's been very informative. In our book, what we're looking at is the history of China, partly because in other, the US and Canada were called the New World. Therefore, part of being the new world is we reject the old and therefore we reject history. Your grandfather could have been a, a, a horse thief or a duke, it doesn't matter in America. And that's part of the charm. But in the rest of the world, history matters. And in China is the only country that's been important throughout all of human history. Um, who knows where the Assyrian empire is? At, you know, we can't even find Assyria on a map. Rome and Athens for their greatness in their day are relatively you know, second tier countries. Not to be rude to them, but they're second tier. They're not great global players they were one day. So something where when you think about it, I think that what's unfolding in Asia with the various roads that you point out, this is a, a pivotal opportunity for Pakistan to consider where, how do we connect with the West? How do we connect with China, with the countries around in an effective way? And there's tensions between India and China, things that you know infinitely better than I do, that I think there's some windows of opportunities you've written about, uh, Dr. Usman, that I think are, are great opportunities right now. Dr. Usman, uh, can I interject here? Please uh, put forward the questions that have been written in the chat box by the participants of this webinar. Yes, sir. Uh, President Saab is absolutely right. The uh, question that I want to get to next is shared by two people, Muhammad Awas and a new entrant at uh, CAS, um, Ms. Sara Siddiq, is that the unemployment factor in aviation. So as we've seen a huge unemployment in aviation pers personnel, this, this cadre, how do you think it, it pans out for people who want to seek a job in the aviation sector just about anywhere in the world? It, it's so much more negative. Like if you look back to January, a number of Canadian pilots moved in the Middle East because they could be tax free for years. It was great to be a pilot. There was a worldwide shortage of pilots. CAE has been doing very well because they make um, simulators that train pilots. So it's something where, but it just went between January and March, it fell off a cliff. So I, I hate to be discouraging, but it's something where there's just a glut of pilots. Now, if you're young, that will end in a few years and it'll come back, but you'll have to be patient for a few years. And it's gonna to be tough times for pilots coming up. It will return, but again, it will probably be less than the demand that we anticipated. And to a certain degree, the pilot training industry grew because of that anticipated demand, which almost certainly won't happen. So, um, but on the other hand, it's better to be young than older. So enjoy uh, being young. And I think it will return, but you'll have to be, you have to have considerable patience. Uh, point taken. There's a question that I want to rephrase, which is from Shiroz Ali, which is that the probability of contracting coronavirus is extremely low on planes. It's one out of 44,000. And then the chances of death from that are just one in 600,000. So given all of this safety, I mean, this, this, this is not my thinking, but the, the question is worth asking, worth posing, is, is this sort of safety really justified in terms of the probabilities? What would you comment on that? I see through one is what is the truth of the matter in the WHO, the Mayo Clinic, 
have been working through IAD and KO. And these are kind of organizations that don't lend their names lightly to something. Uh, one of my former students, I interviewed her for my Forbes blog a couple of weeks ago, um, had uh, dinner with her in February in Geneva, my last big trip. And she is responsible for a large part of this. So we, you know, I've talked to her in Je uh, February and then talked to her recently again about it for an hour. There's a sense in the scientific, scientific community. Now, some science is not, you know, we don't know exactly from a healthcare viewpoint, but that and what people think are two different things. And so we know masks are good, but in America, a lot of people are fighting it. We've had some anti-mask demonstrations here in Canada as well. So it's something where people take different views sometimes and what the science suggests. And I think that's the problem. The science might well suggest that it's very safe. Don't worry about it, but it's in people's minds, sadly. There's a question here from Osama Ibrahim, Ibrahim that according to Brian Pierce, long haul will take a long time to recover. That's something that was on uh, a slide of yours. Uh, so now there's a strong case to focus on domestic flights. However, there are some airlines, Singapore and Cathay Pacific, which don't really have a domestic market per se. And so what sort of strategy should those uh, sorts of airlines adopt when they don't have the domestic to lean on, which might bounce back quicker? Well, it's the same with the super carriers in the Middle East, which are funded by government money and have had enormous growth. I sat down with the CEO of Eddie Head Airlines when I was there a few years ago, um, meet with airlines when I'm over there. They're just in deep trouble. Now that the incredibly uh, deep pockets of their governments might redeem them, but I think they're gonna have to cut very substantially. Simply, they're not allowed to fly to many countries. You don't need to fly. Uh, so I think those are the ones that are, are most at risk is because Singapore is a small country where you can't fly within Singapore. There's literally, you just go up and down. So it's something where that's the nature of it. And it's been brilliant for many years, but they're in even worse trouble than an Air Canada or United Airlines or British Airways because they just don't have much options, sadly. I, I take your point. Can I, can I, can I ask a question uh, from sure. Dr. Moore? Uh, Dr. Moore, uh, what we see from the outside is that it's a very complex situation. It requires joint action on the part of all countries, you know, especially the advanced developed countries. What we see is that they are involved in their domestic politics more and less they are trying to, they are not devoting their enough energies uh, to solve this problem, you know, in terms of how uh, to work out the quarantines, what should be the border control, the issue that you raised yourself. Uh, there is not a concerted effort on their part to get to grips with this problem. Am I right in assuming that? Yes, you're absolutely right. When you look at globalization, 20 years ago, uh, you know, I was writing books and went to conferences and we saw as an un unalloyed good that hundreds of millions of people in the poorest countries were coming out of poverty. That's great. But what we didn't realize that fair parts of America, the UK think Brexit, think President Trump were hurt by globalization. Jobs moving to China, which helped China, but hurt America, the UK, Canada, and other countries. And so what we see is a pushback and President Trump uh, got elected partly because of the pushback from America about globalization. What he's done, and it was actually started to some degree under Obama, but certainly accelerated by President Trump's administration, is pull back from the global uh, institutions that the US helped create after World War II, uh, that we look to the WHO. They, you know, and it's politics to some degree in the election, but the Trump administration obviously, honestly believes they need to pull back and focus on making America great again. And that means the reduction of their support of the UN, the WHO, these great institutions, World Trade Organization. Um, Canada takes exception to that. On the other hand, we're a huge country that is our biggest trade partners, the US, and we're one tenth of their size in terms of uh, population and economy. Other countries disagree a bit, but there's other countries that are pulling back as well. So there's something where globalization continues to morph and will continue to morph. And the question from a Pakistan viewpoint is what's our role and how do we react to this pulling back of globalization? But I think that's reality if Biden gets elected, I think America will continue on considerably 
a similar path. It won't be a dramatic shift back to 20 years ago because the world's changed and America's view of it has changed, the EU view of it has changed. And, and in fact, it has changed. So their view of it has changed based on reality to a considerable degree. And so that's something that the world has got to come to terms with. But the, the fallout of that is that America has apparently lost leadership of the world. You know, it still possesses the coercive power, economic power and military power, et cetera, to force people to do what they want them to do. But the leadership that was evident earlier in the meetings of G7 and G20, et cetera, uh, now seems to be, you know, uh, withering away. Well, they don't wish to be the leader in the same way. And I also think that people are looking at what's happening with the second wave and America, we both love it and we're all going, what are they doing? And so I think they've lost a certain amount of that leadership by just some silly things and silly response where the world goes, this is dumb, but we've always admired that you America, you've always been, you know, a beacon of freedom in your better moments. China is not trying to create an empire. There's the Belt and Road and the things that Dr. Isman has written about, and that's great, but they don't seem to be one that wants to be world conquering and make the whole world Chinese, but they want the world to respond very respectfully to China. So that's something that there's an evolution and China will take a different role than the US has. And I think that's sad for the world to a considerable degree, but I am North American. So I, I probably would say that. Thank you. Uh, sir, I continue with your permission. Um, yes. There, uh, better, um, I'm, I'm glad to say that there's a lot of good questions coming in. Uh, there's a colleague uh, of ours here at CAS, Air Marshal Ashwak Arai, who has asked a two-part question. Uh, he, uh, Air Marshal Ashwak Arai is asking that you know, all the airlines are facing financial crises. Some airlines are continuing to increase their revenues by using alternative techniques, such as you know offering airline meals at restaurants and other outlets rather than yeah. on the plane itself. And you know some options may help airlines to compensate for lost uh, revenue and sustain themselves, but it will not shift their focus from their primary business, or will it? How, how do you perceive them? I, I may have read the same Financial Times article the uh, Vice Marshal read. It was very amusing that, you know, they're selling it in stores and you go, try, you try to avoid airplane food or at least get the, the food from business class sent back. One area where they actually grow, and I've talked to Air Canada um, about cargo. So there's an interesting thing where um, our family would buy something maybe once a month and have it delivered. Now it's twice a week, it appears. So we just buy things online and have them delivered and you hear a doorbell once or twice a day and someone just drop by and they leave it on your front step. And so that way you don't have to actually, you know, be close to them. They don't have to be close to you. So it's safe. What we've seen is cargo has really grown up and this is an area where there's some profit potential. And so there's some airlines that are turning um, aircraft is going to reduce the number of seats and make part of that cargo. So this is something we see a trend happening, which is good. It's great that they're adopting and pivoting, but it's certainly not going to rescue them, but it's going to help a bit. So we certainly that's something I've talked to people at Air Canada and read other articles about that is actively happening out there. And these airline um, meals are, you know, very low price, one, $2 to $9. They are not going to help too much. No, I mean, I, I, it's entrepreneurial of them. It's clever. Hats off to them, but it's, you know, it, it's going to help, but it's not going to rescue them. Yes. Um, the second part of Air Marshal Ashfaq's question is that reduced air travel has impacted the leasing companies and reducing the leasing rates. So how will the reduced numbers in aircraft production impact the price of new aircraft? And where does leasing fall into that? Well, there's so many aircraft out there sitting in the deserts and they put them in deserts on uh, not Toronto or Montreal because of the weather, it's better for the plane. You've got to maintain them, but there's a worldwide glut of aircraft out there. Um, so something where I still think like the uh, the Ace, uh, the A, um, the old C-series at Airbus, they'll, they'll be, they're being made and there's a market for them. The Max, when it gets, it's being tested now around the world when it comes back, but um, it's just going to be difficult for leasing companies. Um, Aldo, the big shoe company I mentioned, has thousands of stores around the world, went into bankruptcy protection, partly because they were negotiating uh, and asking for reductions. But once you go into bankruptcy protection in the US or Canada, 
you can just say, we're just stopping the contract in 30 days and walk away from contracts you signed for years. And that's one of the big things. One reason they needed to do that is they had about 4,000 stores and they didn't need a couple thousand of them. And they had signed leases in Manhattan, Silicon Valley, which were just very expensive. It made sense if you had customers, when you don't have customers, it's outrageous. And they just had to get rid of them. And I think we're seeing something similar in the leasing industry. It was a great industry for years. You're in deep trouble, say levy. What can point, you do? Point taken. Uh, on this uh, Silavi point, uh, Fatma Shaquille is asking, I, I ask it with a cynical tone, but I think it's an important question. Uh, what, is the, what are the prospects for students who want to study aviation management as a course? As a professor, would you recommend that as a degree for kids? Well, something where we teach that, you know, at McGill on a continuing study. So I think if you're an experienced person, it's good to renew your knowledge. It's good to find out what the latest trends are if you have a job. Now, if you're 21, 22, it'll probably take you four or five years. And so it's a bit of a risk, but it'll probably work out, but there'll be jobs available for you then. Um, a lot of pilots are retiring because, well, they have no choice. But it's not the most attractive industry right now and won't be for several years. But if you do have a position, encourage you to do a continuing study things to keep up in the knowledge, they'll make you more attractive as a person. And I think it'd be fun learning. Not a great industry for a young person to get into, though, if you're, you know, if you're late teens, early 20s, taking a longer view, it could well work out for you. Point taken. Um, in your interviews with uh, the CEOs and other uh, management professionals, this question comes from Tahir Niaz, that what impact do you foresee uh, on the part of customers' preference for direct and nonstop flights as opposed to indirect flights with stopovers? Is there any inkling that, that there's a preferential change economically among consumers? Well, there is in the sense that why take the, the extra risk on board of going through another a Heathrow or Frankfurt or Schiphol. Why do that? If you can go point to point, it reduces your risk. So the question is how much risk is it in the mind of the average flyer? And they see going through airports as risky, so I'll avoid that. But it's something, and, and you know, you've flown many times through the big connector airports. There, I mean, a Frankfurt, a Heathrow, part of the joy is, you know, the wonderful shops, restaurants, things like that. I have a favorite a restaurant, a French restaurant at Heathrow. I go there whenever I'm there. I go get a shirt from Thomas Pink. But it's always a bit scary, just the sheer size. And you don't want to be at Terminal 5, and I've got to go to Terminal 3. It's just a horrifying thought. I've never missed a flight, but the sheer numbers, the sheer things that you go through, people want to avoid that these days. And I think that will continue to some degree for a couple of years that will start calming down as we get more flying experience and be, become more comfortable with it. Uh, also, that, if, you are, if you are transiting and you uh, get caught by that thermometer, you are stranded midway. You know, you are neither at your home nor you are at your destination. And so they probably that have more, to... more expensive healthcare. Yes and, yes. and does your travel insurance cover you for healthcare in Heathrow or in London. Yes. And you just, this is a so horrifying thought. Don't, don't take chances, just stay put. Well, when <laughs> I was going to go to Iceland, I was going to get a COVID-19 test in Montreal, make sure I'm fine, and then maybe get on, you know, get on the plane. But Iceland is very expensive. The idea of having to be in a hospital for 10 days in Iceland, the bill is huge. I'd rather be where I'm covered in Canada for free, for sure, or somewhere at least it's a bit more reasonable. On the other hand, world-class doctors are what you want wherever you are if you're sick. Yes, indeed. We're getting a question here. I think it's very interesting that um, it goes back to the Greta Thunberg effect you discussed that airplanes and air, this is from Sada Sadiq, air, airplanes and airlines are not necessarily the best option in every country's case, especially if they have struggling airlines. So why not take an opportunity to launch massive stimulus uh, in the economy? For example, to launch and accelerate green infrastructure packages that set targets for emission-free uh, sort of projects. You had mentioned emission-free airlines in their design as well. So how about that great green new deal aspect given coronavirus. In fact, that's what uh, Prime Minister Trudeau is doing in Canada. 
that his uh, one of his big things is climate change. And so he's seeing this as an opportunity to put that more central to the agenda. And a part of it would be, you know, high speed trains uh, is a way of getting people around. We see China's grown enormously that way. We see a growth in Europe, not in the US or Canada, partly because of size and just, you know, uh, volumes of population between let's say Toronto and Montreal, because it costs billions of dollars and the cost relative to the, 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 the traffic. So I think that there are, um, certainly we are doing this in Canada. We see other governments where it's an opportunity for people concerned about climate change to use this crisis as an opportunity to push other things forward. Um, and, and that's great within countries, trains are finer in Europe between countries. Uh, it's more problematic though, when you're uh, looking at doing it between countries. You know, flying from Canada to Pakistan, we can do, we can't take a train or we need a submarine as part of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, point taken. Um, so a lot of our discussion is centered around uh, the developed countries, including Canada, but uh, one of our bright researchers, Anika Safter, has raised the question where, how do the airlines in the developing world, where even if the government wanted to help, it wouldn't be able to, in terms of stimulus and backing it. What are your suggestions for airlines in the developing world to respond in an agile manner to the disruptions that have occurred because of coronavirus? Well, I think the airlines, you know, they're gonna to have to cut back dramatically. They have to choose who they let go, who they keep, and be very uh, creative about that and strategic in saying, we got to cut back. We're going to recover slowly. Let's make sure we are positioning ourselves in terms of our staff and our planes, our fleet in the best way of doing that. So it takes some thought and a real knowledge, I think, of your own organization and, and the potential. So I think that's a, a real challenge for the, the senior executives to think about. And uh, do you see in that regard any change, including in the developed countries, for the airlines between the mix of passenger that they expect to get? I know that you alluded to it in terms of uh, changes between uh, corporate and leisure and the business executives. But if we could talk a little bit more about the mix that would be realistic in this crisis period until 2024, and then after that, what sort of mix do you see in terms of the customers? Well, something that I think business class if you're in tough times, one way you can save money is moving from business class to the back. Now, if you're on an hour flight, Montreal to Toronto, which is one of our big routes, what can they do to you in business class to make you happy? You can only drink so much, eat so much. Um, now, on the other hand, if you're flying to Vancouver six hours or Montreal to Tokyo where it's 14, business class really matters. In terms, as a hard-nosed business person, I want you to be real, more, in better shape and get to Tokyo, but you're negotiating for me. So I can justify the money. But one way to save money is very clearly is to move from the business class to the back. The problem from an airline viewpoint, business class is very profitable and often where we make the money, but we're happy to have it been on a plane these days, but we're gonna see that sitting in the back is more of a common phenomenon. Just a reaction we've seen in probably four or five rec uh, recessions that I've endured. And when I worked at IBM, this is just one of the responses we had, which just makes a lot of sense. Uh, one of our esteemed uh, directors at CAS has raised an important question. Director for the aviation industry, uh, AVM Sohail Malik asks uh, that, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Moore, you pointed out that many uh, businesses are likely to go bankrupt. I was also interested in asking you this. It's a chapter 11 perspective on this. Uh, that in the same context, do you see a lot of mergers and acquisitions, M&A activity, consolidation in the industry? Or what sorts of movements within the players would happen until 2024 and then perhaps beyond that? Well, it's certainly very possible that CM&A, but it, who's attractive to buy? So the question is, at what price? So the value has gone down very substantially. Do I need their fleet? Well, if they have a good fleet from a, a viewpoint of the size of plane I'm looking for, I don't need a lot of pilots and flight attendants. So it's kind of, what is it that I'm getting from them? Excuse me, the value that has gone down considerably. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think we'll see some M&A, but at much lower price points, most likely. and because the question, what is the value of the assets? And the value of the assets declined dramatically in a month. 
absolutely. Um, one of our bright researchers, Han Bai Jaz, uh, is waxing poetic here in the manner that I would. I also wax poetic about the world after coronavirus. So um, it post-coronavirus chaos offers a unique opportunity to reframe the foundations of the global economy and the global airline industry. Very much something I would say as well. So is there a political will or a will among the people and among public managers, public value creators to grasp that potential? So is the opportunity, but is the political will there and you can speak for Canada, US, and the developing world on that. I'm not sure there's the courage to do that as widely as, um, as your question suggests. And I think it's a great question. And I appreciate uh, uh, he or she and your perspective. And, and it's the entrepreneurial mindset, which means, you know, but the corporate mindset is one of carefulness of what are the analysis, where's it going to lead us? where the entrepreneur sees opportunities where other people see threats. And so in my class, I always have a bunch of uh, entrepreneur CEOs come in and it's just a different mindset. But what we, that entrepreneurial mindset of pivoting, it's a Silicon Valley kind of approach. I think there's real opportunities there, but the airline industry is not one which is particularly creative and entrepreneurial, sadly. There are some wonderful exceptions, you know, think of Sir Richard Branson and a virgin, but by and large, it's more conservative, hidebound organizations at times. When you mentioned Sir Richard Branson, it ties back to the very first question I had asked about the management, because this is a guy who pops champagne bottles and, and has a bravado, and then he's the one first hat in hand asking for a bailout. And so uh, the public was very reluctant to give him uh, that bailout. And so how about the corporate culture at airlines and at airports changing because of this? Well, it's becoming a bit more conservative and careful and not as um, exuberant as it has been in the past. And uh, Sir Richard has you know, struggled with uh, Virgin and, and the things both in Australia and the UK and so on. It's an interesting challenge that I think that the times are uncertain, that there'll be opportunities, but there are fairly rare opportunities out there, sadly. Uh, Professor, I'd like to thank you for all the time that, that you've given us and all these insights. And I think that it opens our perspectives and our horizons, not just to how things could change in Pakistan, but in, in the world at large in aviation. So I would like to invite President Cass Air Chief Marshal Khalid Msada to, to give his uh, concluding remarks at this juncture. Sir, I defer to you. Thank you very much. Dr. Moore, thank you very much again uh, for sparing time with us for us and also discussing this very complex yet important uh, economic activity. And uh, you have made important points. You have uh, explained to us different perspectives of the industry, of the government, of the stakeholders, of the travelers, and uh, how all these things uh, impact them. Uh, of course, we know that it has impacted different people differently. Uh, amongst the saddest story that I heard was on BBC when this gentleman, the reporter, went to a dairy farm. And this owner said he was in tears. He said that I have to milk my cows, I have to look after them, but I have to throw the milk in the drains mm. because the supermarkets will not buy them. So they were incurring all the ex expense, but making no, uh, getting no revenue for it, mm. you know. Uh, the aeroplanes can be parked and momentarily you could cut costs, but you know, there are some people who just can't, uh, don't have that uh, luxury, as we can say. So uh, the important points are that uh, uh, how can IATA and ICO and different governments get together uh, to find a way forward, you know, mutually acceptable because the stakes uh, of people are different. You know, the, the airport operators, the airport employees, the airlines, the passengers and all, they have uh, different stakes in this particular industry. Uh, and the resolution of their in, uh, collective problems is not so easy. Uh, so like I said in my question that uh, what uh, I expected was that there'll be more concerted effort on the part of the governments to come to grips with this problem and perhaps we can move forward. But I assume that, uh, as you explained, that IATA and ICAO are doing their best to 
uh, enhance the aviation activity by which obviously the airlines and the airports and the other businesses related to aviation can stay afloat. Uh, I agree with your uh, tribute that you paid to Dr. Osman. He is an asset for CAS uh, and we are thankful to you for uh, educating him and training him and you know providing him all the uh, insights, etc. cetera. Uh, so the point that was made again is that uh, point-to-point uh, -point travel is going to be uh, the way forward uh, in narrow-bodied, smaller aeroplanes where you can fill them up and you know and carry people from point to point. Uh, transit uh, stops are uh, obviously not very convenient, and in fact, it may be uh, very very disturbing. So uh, it was a pleasure to have you here, uh, and we are much better better educated. Uh, on this uh, topic on which you spoke. And on behalf of all team members of CAS, uh, I wish to thank you again uh, for taking time out. My pleasure. Thank you very much for the very thank kind you. invitation. And I've enjoyed our conversation a great deal. And our invitation stands. You can visit Pakistan. We'll uh, host you. I will. I will take you <laughs> up on that, Air Marshal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for those concluding remarks. Uh, professor, again, I'm grateful as ever. We have a long friendship, and this is just one manifestation of, of that. You've educated CAS, you've educated the public, so uh, I'm in your uh, gratitude as always. Um, sir, with your permission, I now uh, bring this uh, webinar to its conclusion. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Allah Hafiz. Thank you.